To say that I was excited for The Lighthouse would be an understatement. Robert Eggers proved himself a force to be reckoned with with the release of his first feature-length film in 2015, The Witch. The Lighthouse is Eggers' sophomore film, and while I expected something good, especially after the buzz the film got from its debut at Cannes Film Festival, I don't think I or anyone else was prepared for the beautiful, amazing movie that we were given. The cinematography, the costuming, the set designs are all gorgeous. It somehow looks like it was actually shot in the 1890s, which is when the film is set. The performances from Defoe and Pattinson are more than Oscar worthy and it is incredible to see them give such a range within a less than two hour period. The entire film is a fantastic study of the human condition and what happens when you isolate two men on a desolate island for an indefinite amount of time. Or is it? Because another really interesting aspect of this film has been the discussion and various interpretations that have arisen. There is the concept that the film is simply the events unfolding before the audience from the perspective of Winslow as he slowly loses his mind. There's debate over what is real and what is delusion, whether Winslow or Tom is the delusional character. If Winslow and Tom are just younger and older versions of each other, created by one or the other to escape the maddening loneliness of the island, there may not be a definitively correct answer, or at the very least we may never know exactly what Robert and Max Eggers had in mind when writing the film. But that doesn't mean there isn't a worthwhile discussion to have. As a film buff and as a member of film discussion communities, I love talking about film and trying to find a deeper meaning and message in a film. Which is why for this video, I want to talk about how I think that there is only one shot in this entire movie that's actually real. And the rest is just a hallucinatory dream created by the dying mind of Winslow. The key to this entire analysis of mine lies in the final shot of the movie, or under this theory, the only shot that actually shows reality. We see Winslow naked somewhere on a rocky seashore with disfigured eyes and revealed organs as seabirds continue to peck at his mangled body, relieving themselves on him while they're at it. Anyone who saw the movie would agree and see that there was a disconnect between this shot and the previous shot of the film which shows Winslow tumbling down the stairs of the lighthouse, fully clothed. The only injuries we would know him to have is the gash on his arm from the axe he took on the shoulder, whatever injury was causing all the blood on his face, and anything he sustained from tumbling down the stairs. Winslow's body is positioned in such a way in the final shot that we can't see his left shoulder, which would reveal if the gash is there or not, and provide more evidence for or against this interpretation, and that very well may have been by design. Though it's a bit harder to tell in black and white, he doesn't appear to have near the amount of blood on his face as he did before, and he now has blood on several places along his entire body that was previously covered up by clothing. Now, it's entirely possible if you take this movie a bit more literally that Winslow, after tumbling down the stairs in his madness, stumbled to the shore, stripped down, and then eventually succumbed to his injuries sustained from his fall and ended up too weak to move as the seabirds took their revenge upon him. But why not show some sort of connecting shot? Or at the very least, why not show any aspect of the island the audience would be able to identify and definitively place Winslow in in the background, even as it zooms out to show more of the environment. This definitely confused me a bit right after I saw the film, and so I took a while to munch on the thought and mull it over and see what I could come up with. There's the classic joke or cliche in media and literature that the character then woke up, revealing the entire thing was just a dream, which for a movie with as many surreal elements in it as The Lighthouse, the thought passed my mind. But then the thought stuck. And then the more I thought about it, the more evidence I picked up on that was in the film that would actually support this idea. But instead of this movie being a wacky and fun dream, this movie is about Winslow's mind trying to come to terms with the sin of his life, his religion, and his now inevitable death as he slowly slips away. Imagine for a second, instead of the final shot being just that, a final shot in the chronological timeline of the film, imagine that Winslow has actually been there in that position for the entire runtime of the movie, maybe even longer. Then what you have is a self-described, God-fearing man with a lot of guilty sin weighing on his conscience, dying on some forgotten shore, listening to the sounds of the sea and birds to draw into his subconscious, and building an entire scenario in his head around these sounds. Everything we see in the film leading up to the final moment are different aspects of Winslow's mind trying to prevent his death, or trying to come to some peace with God, based around this maritime theme. 
To start this discussion, let's talk about how this movie is full of a lot of dreamlike elements. And I'm well aware that this is the low-hanging fruit of the argument, but it is still important to this concept, so I'm gonna ask that you hear me out here. In a dream, the mind often has a poor sense of time, has an inconsistent story, and confuses itself. There is a lost sense of time throughout this entire film. There are no repetitive shots or elements to show a passage of time, we only know how much time has supposedly passed when a character actually says it, and nothing you would typically expect to change over a period of time does. The most obvious case I noticed was the fact that the facial hair, especially on Winslow, never changes length. He has mostly stubble except for his mustache. This is especially relevant later in the film as you'd expect someone losing their mind to probably not have the most consistent of a shaving routine, and yet his beard length never seems to change from that initial stubbly shorter length. And then the story of you would seems to change as the movie progresses. There are several scenes that appear to be Willem Dafoe's character Tom gaslighting Winslow by telling him different versions of the same story, like the story of how he injured his leg or how much time has passed on the island. You even have some events that seem to be started but never finished, shown or referenced again, like when the two of them were painting the lighthouse. And then of course, there are the several hallucination sequences throughout the film, some implied to be dreams, others not. The movie itself is even open to the idea of it all being a hallucination. Tom tells Winslow at one point he's probably wandering mad and frostbitten in a Canadian forest talking to himself, and the evidence seems to support this being a legitimate theory rather than a passing comment meant to rile up Winslow. But in this case, he's not wandering mad in a forest, he's dying on a seashore. I find this idea to really start to come together when you take a look at Tom's character, and there is a lot to talk about here. Tom is Winslow's superior, and his primary roles are to ensure that Winslow is doing the majority of the work on the grounds of the island and watching the actual light of the lighthouse. Most importantly, ensuring that Winslow doesn't get to the light. Light, especially an elevated light, is a common metaphor in literature for the afterlife in heaven, and throughout the film, the light is Winslow's desire. This is even before he loses his mind, he expresses his desire to get to it very early in the movie and becomes extremely frustrated the more it's denied from him. It's what causes the tension between Tom and Winslow. So if we consider this idea and think about this conflict in terms of it being Winslow's dying illusion, we see that Winslow on some subconscious level is ready to die and face his maker, to go to the light, but Tom is there to prevent that from happening. I think that Tom is a manifested character by Winslow's mind whose purpose is to prevent Winslow from getting to the light and to take care of Winslow, effectively doing what his mind thinks will prevent his death. Tom's role as this manifested character of the mind, guardian of the light for Winslow, and his determination to prevent Winslow's death would explain a lot of different actions and behaviors we see from Tom throughout the film. Tom seems to know things about Winslow that he's never actually seen or confirmed to have been told on camera. He knows that Winslow killed the seabird, and he knows that Winslow has pocketed a knife that he later takes from him and breaks for his own safety, according to Tom. But how would Tom even know these things when there's nothing in the film to suggest he saw, was told, or figured it out himself? Unless, of course, he just knows because he is an aspect of Winslow's mind. Tom also does almost no work around the island on camera except tend to the light, cook, and administrative duties in his book. The only time we see him do anything else in the entire film is when Winslow asks him for help in boarding up the windows before the storm and there's a single shot of him helping. Otherwise, very little work is done by Tom. He's just ensuring that Winslow does all the work. All of the work in staying alive, that is. We see Tom extremely angry at Winslow when he isn't upkeeping the house to his standards. The house in the grounds of the island would be Winslow's metaphorical body in this situation. The house was already a bit run down when they arrived at the island, which would reflect Winslow's initial injury, and slowly throughout the film, the state of the house gets worse and worse. I initially thought this was meant to reflect his mental state, and it very well may, depending on your interpretation, but it could also reflect the physical state of his body as he dies. Tom also gets very offended by Winslow's lack of appreciation for his cooking, and as a side note, Defoe delivers a god-tier monologue about this. Tom is essentially offended that Winslow doesn't appreciate him taking care of him and trying to prevent his death. There's also the why do you spill you're being seen, Winslow in that scene is making a confession, which in the Christian faith is considered a crucial final or near final step before death. It's why we hear Tom's character express a disappointment that Winslow is giving his confession. Tom knows it's a sign that he's getting closer to death. It's also revealed later in the film that both characters have the first name Thomas, 
Now this further connects to the idea that these characters are two aspects of the same person or at least in some way related to each other or similar. But looking even deeper, with this fact, Tom's full name is revealed to be Thomas Wake. This could just be a maritime reference as Wake is a term related to the sea. But change the punctuation a little bit and you're given a command and Tom's purpose as a character. He wants Winslow or Thomas to wake up. And as a last point to this element, there's also a scene where Winslow is confronting Tom and telling him that he is essentially a parody of the old sailor character. And I found that interesting because doesn't that seem to be exactly the type of character that a hallucinating mind near the sea would conjure up? He fits the stereotype to a T because that's what Winslow's mind was able to come up with in its compromised state. So moving on from Tom's character, I want to talk about why Winslow wasn't able to find any peace in the light or God and why it ultimately rejected him at the end of the film. And that was because of Winslow's unresolved sins that manifest themselves as the mermaid and an alcohol. And to be clear, I'm not saying that consuming alcohol is a sin in the Christian religion, but gluttony and overindulgence are considered sins, and that's how the alcohol plays into this concept. The mermaid, of course, plays to the sin of lust. I mean, he finds the seemingly unconscious mergirl on a rock, and one of the first things he does is cop a feel. And, um, how to word this as PG as possible. He certainly created an image of her with extremely exaggerated lady parts for himself to fantasize about having relations with. And he seems unable to control these urges and feelings despite his apparent shame in it. We have the scene of him really enjoying himself to the mermaid figurine and thinking about her in a very much a less than holy way. But then immediately after he is done, he throws the figure, breaks it, and attempts to stab it with his knife. He's clearly showing some regret and remorse for his deviancy, which is very consistent with Christian ideology, especially for the time period. And even after that moment where he seems to be rejecting that aspect of himself, we know he still hasn't come to a peace with that because he sees the mermaid again later while he's attacking Tom, and he's once again attracted to her and tempted by her. This is an unresolved, unconfessed sin, and it's very similar to the alcohol. Gluttony in particular is typically thought of as a problem when being gluttonous affects the mind, body, and or the life of whoever it is indulging. And while Winslow initially doesn't partake in the drinking, and then it's at first to only have some fun and doesn't really have much of a negative impact on his life or work, once he cracks into the rations, as the movie puts it, it all goes downhill for him. Tom records in his book, Winslow stops performing to the best of his abilities in his job, which was likely a parallel to his real life. He had problems with alcohol abuse and it kept him from working and living the best Christian life that he could. He even got so desperate in the movie for more of it that he mixes and drinks kerosene and honey to get his fix. This is another unresolved sin that Winslow has weighing on his soul. On the final note about the sins, in a way the mermaid and the alcohol that he would indulge on start off as his hidden on the island. The figurine of the mermaid is hidden in the mattress and found and taken by Winslow that he then hides in his coat pocket when they first arrive on the island. And the rations are dug up by Winslow and Tom later in the film. This could play to the idea that we try to hide sins about ourselves or not confront them directly. If you wanted to discuss why Tom would introduce Winslow to his alcohol stash, I would imagine it was probably a mechanism to try and keep him grounded and worldly as he knew if Winslow was still a sinner when and if he did manage to get to the light, he still wouldn't be able to actually enter it, which to Tom's thought process may have prevented his death altogether. Winslow's mind on some subconscious level knew it was dying and his soul, consciously or not, knew that it wasn't ready or able to be accepted into the light of God. So Winslow's mind, perhaps assisted by God, perhaps not, essentially created its own version of purgatory for Winslow, where he would be tempted by his cardinal sins and he had the chance to overcome them or succumb to them. The tragedy of the lighthouse isn't Winslow's descent into madness. It's the loss of his soul from God, and as old Tom himself said, Winslow was doomed to be lost and forgotten to any man, time, or deity as the sea took him for all eternity. That pretty much covers all my notes on this idea, but I want to know what you guys thought. What interpretations did you get out of the film? Do you think I'm way off base or do you have even more evidence you think could contribute to this conversation? As always, feel free to start a discussion below and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.